With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and micromycel technology. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Hello and welcome to the Open Your Eyes podcast. I'm Dr. Kerry Gell, the host of the documentary, Open Your Eyes. Great news, you can now watch the entire Open Your Eyes film on Apple TV, iTunes, and Google Play. Also, visit the film's website at OpenYourEyes2020.com. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell to get notifications of great new interviews. Also, please leave comments. Dry eye treatment can be very complicated and frustrating for both the physician and patient. Today's guest, Rockland, California-based optometrist, Dr. Lisa Hornick. Dr. Hornick has dedicated her practice to those suffering with dry eye disease. Dr. Hornick has served her country as a U.S. Navy Lieutenant Commander, delivering eye care at two major U.S. Navy medical hospitals. In today's interview, she shares the latest technology and treatment options used to treat ocular rosacea and dry eye disease, including the fascinating intense pulse light therapy. Dr. Hornick, thank you for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's really great to be here. It's great to see you again. Well, I want to first thank you for your service to our country. We mm -hmm. are very, very proud of you at Open Your Eyes, and the optometric community is very proud of you. No, I appreciate that. It was, it was my pleasure. So I want to ask you, what, what got you interested in treating dry eyes at such a level, such a high level? You know, those patients really suffer. And uh, what made you want to deal with those type of patients? Well, what really spurred me is I, I suffer from dry eye myself, so I can really relate to those patients and form a bond with them because I feel their pain, literally. Um, and what really got me into dry eye disease was, um, as you mentioned, we're a military family. My husband uh, was a pilot in the Coast Guard, and we were stationed in Kodiak, Alaska. And the doctor that I worked for there was in private practice. That was my first experience with private practice. He had just purchased a LipaFlow device, and he said, hey, I want you to start my dry eye clinic for me. So I was really excited about that. And when I was doing the mybography, which looks at the structure of your meibomian glands, I realized that I myself have really atrophied my bomian glands and that so I have my bomian gland dysfunction as well and that is part of what was contributing to my dry eye. So once I discovered that I just became sort of a sponge and wanted to learn everything that I could about how to treat dry eye disease um, and it just really spurred from there it's something that I really enjoy um, it really I love giving back to my patients and I, it just it's really a great great thing. So what causes the atrophy of the meibomian glands? So lots of different things. Um, dry eye disease, we call it multifactorial. So in other words, there's so many different things that, that cause dry eye. Um, and for my bone glands specifically, a lot of times what happens is we have an incomplete blink. Um, so in other words, when the top lid and the bottom lid we don't actually interact when we blink. Um, and so we need that pressure from the, the pressure on the lids that releases oils from the meibomian glands. And if the oil doesn't get released and it gets kind of stuck or blocked in those meibomian glands, then, and if, after years and years and years, then it can actually atrophy and those glands go away. So you mentioned mybography before. Explain what that is and what that shows us as doctors. 
Yeah, so my, my biography is really helpful because it helps us get to what the root cause of the dry eye disease and how advanced the dry eye disease is. So when we look at the structure of the most meibomian glands, we can see if they are nice and healthy, if you have all of your glands, or if some of the glands are maybe shortened, or if they're uh, what we call dilated, so sort of thicker than they should be. Um, and if they are really atrophied, they might have just sort of little nubs left. And then we know uh, what stage of the dry eye disease is. And sort of that's how we, um, that's how we decide really what our treatment options are, how advanced we need in our treatments. You know, when you do that test, you know, you could see patients that have little curly ones, little mm -hmm. short ones, and then patients that don't have any at yeah. all, any of these meibomian glands. Now, yeah. do you notice that symptoms are correlated with the configuration of the meibomian glands? And if there aren't any, are the symptoms much more severe? So that's a great question because, and that's where I think as practitioners, we have some confusion with how to treat dry eye disease. I have seen, I would say in general, it, the, the less meibomian glands you have, or the more sort of clogged up or obstructed those meibomian glands are, then you will have more symptoms, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, so I have seen patients with really, really atrophied or in lots of problems with their meibomian glands, and their symptoms just don't quite seem to correlate. Um, and then I have some patients that have actually very healthy meibomian glands, and they just are really suffering with their symptoms. So I wouldn't say it's an exact correlation, but it is very helpful. And I think that's part of that multifactorial part of dry eye disease. So um, it's not just meibomian gland dysfunction, but there can be other reasons why they have dry eye as well. Well, tell us what some of those other reasons are. Yeah, so um, they could be aqueous deficient, so they're not producing enough of the watery part of the tears. Um, they could be, you know, could be just their lifestyle. Um, maybe they're not getting enough sleep, not drinking enough water, eating a highly processed diet that is very inflammatory. Um, there's, you know, systemic diseases that cause dry eye, medications cause dry eye, um, refractive surgery, cataract surgery. There's something called rosacea which is a, another systemic disease that causes dry eye. So that's, there's, there's quite a different, and, and a lot of times it's not just one thing. Um, there's multiple reasons kind of all together. And so that's why I feel that dry eye is really interesting and exciting because it's kind of like a mystery that you have to solve all the puzzle pieces and put them together to really get the best outcome. So let's dive into the symptoms. What are some yeah. of the symptoms that a dry eye patient will experience? Yeah, and, and that's a great question too, because um, there's actually 16 million people that are diagnosed with dry eye disease, but we feel um, as optometrists and ophthalmologists that there's probably a lot more that are out there that just don't realize that they have dry eye. So there, there's probably twice that number of people that have dry eye, but they just don't realize that they have it. So some of those symptoms are, um, it can be a wide range from burning, stinging of the eyes, a foreign body sensation, the uh, redness, of course, um, worsening. Uh, sometimes it's worse in the morning. Sometimes it's worse at the end of the day. Um, so, and actually it's kind of counterintuitive, but watering is, is a symptom of dry eyes. So your eyes are making enough of the quantity of tears, so the watery part of the tears, but it's not a good quality tear. So you you're probably don't have enough of that oil layer, the lipid layer. So the lacrimal gland is producing all these tears, but then they're just not staying in the eye. So it feels like they're watering. And a lot of times I tell my patients that, oh, well, you know, your eyes water, you have dry eyes. And they say, well, that doesn't really make sense. Um, but then when you explain it, they say, oh, okay, now I get it. So explain why that happens. Yeah, so, so your tear film has to be in a perfect balance. Um, we call it homeostasis. So you want, there's, right now, we're, we think, we feel there's three layers of the tear film. There's some people that say there's actually two layers, but uh, traditionally there's three layers of the tear film. There's the mucin layer, which kind of holds everything together. There's the watery layer, which is, that's what we, or, or aqueous is what we call it. We normally think of the aqueous layer when we think of tears. Um, and then there's that lipid layer. So the top layer, and we really need all those three layers to be in a perfect balance. Um, and if not, then we get, you know, either the, all the symptoms. So the dryness or, or the watering. Um, so if you don't have enough of that water, of that lipid layer, then you're going to have that excess watering. If you go through the different layers from mucin mm -hmm. to aqueous to mm -hmm. lipid, yeah. what, the, what part of the eye makes each layer and mm -hmm. what's the function of each part of the, of the tears? 
Yeah, so the goblet cells, they um, are, or excuse me, the goblet cells make the mucin layer. And so the mucin kind of holds everything together. The lacrimal gland makes the watery part of the tears. And the water part of the tears, that has all kinds, it actually has 1500 different um, components to it. So the tear film is actually really, really amazing, all the different things that it can do from anti-inflammatory um, to, you know, just all kinds of different things that factors that we need to have a nice healthy tear and a healthy eye. Um, and then there's that lipid layer, which is made by those meibomian glands that are right in the, right on the lid margin, right there is where they come out, where the oil comes out. So, and that's that oily part of the tears that we need to keep everything stable. Every once in a while, we get a big, strong guy, yeah. uh, like a military guy yeah. uh, comes into the office and he's at work and, and, you know, his, he, all of a sudden his eyes are tearing and yeah. he gets very embarrassed that he's crying and he wants to know what we could do, especially if he goes out in, 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 the, in the wind and, he, and the wind hits his eyes and right. starts tearing. What, could, what kind of tricks can we tell people like this to help them? Yeah. So, so I would definitely tell them, and it is, it is, it's embarrassing to patients. It, it, it actually really affects their mental health, you know, and I have a lot of women who their eyes are really red or they can't wear makeup because it, their eyes are so sensitive. Um, and you really feel for those patients because it, it affects their lifestyle and it, it just affects their overall quality of, of life, really. Um, and so for those watery um, ones, it's usually we have to fix those mybomian glands. So we recommend that they go ahead and see their local optometrist um, and get a really good eye exam. Um, if you can find someone that specifically specializes or, or is more passionate about dry eye, that's even better because they might have extra tools like my biography. Um, but you really don't need fancy equipment to be able to treat dry eye. So if you get a really good exam, um, they can give you great recommendations. And some just sort of starter recommendations are artificial tears, especially lipid-based artificial tears that are preservative free. Um, nothing like Visine or gets the red out because those that can actually make your eyes more dry if you use them for too long. So a nice artificial tear that's lipid-based because that gets that oil back into the tear film. Then after that, we recommend- Recommendation, I'm sorry to interrupt for a second. Yeah. Give us a recommendation on a lipid-based artificial tear. Yeah, so th there's quite a few out there. Um, I personally like Refresh Uptive is a good one. Sustained Balance is a good one. Um, what else is out there? Retain MGD. So there's, if you go to the pharmacy, it is a little bit overwhelming because there's so many options. But if you just look for something that um, it says just artificial tear, nothing that says gets the red out. And you look at those little vials that are preservative free, those are really the best ones. And it should probably say something on it about, about a lipid based, but those are a couple options for you. Uh, sorry to interrupt. Go back to the tearing and the big strong guys. Oh, okay. Um, well, any other tricks? Oh, sure. Any other tricks? Um, so we recommend um, diet changes, actually. So I ask patients, you know, are you drinking enough water? Are you going out to eat to fast food all the time? So we found that um, a diet that's rich in omega-3s is actually very healthy. So I recommend to my patients an omega-3 supplement. Um, and that really helps them. It gets everything back in balance and it gives their body the building blocks they need to produce the right type of oils for the meibomian glands. Yeah, I mean, since 2011, there's been over 10 studies that show that omega-3s help people with dry eye disease. So omega-3s can be very help, help, helpful and eating foods that have omega-3s such as wild salmon, sardines, mackerel, you wanna to try to make sure that, the, that, it, that it doesn't have a lot of mercury and it's uh, something that's organic. But uh, you know, certainly something I have found that, and omega-3 supplements are definitely, definitely helpful. It was interesting, there was that one study, the DREAM study, uh -huh. which showed that the omega-3s really wasn't that much beneficial mm -hmm. to the placebo, but the placebo was olive oil. Right. So it shows that olive oil is actually helpful. Even though omega-3 was a little better than olive oil, it wasn't statistically significant, but they both help quite a bit. So sure. uh, I, I thought that was really a fascinating study, but there's many, many studies that show mm -hmm. the benefit uh, of omega-3. Now, going back to symptoms, some people mm -hmm. have dry eyes so bad that they have a lot of anxiety. If you mm -hmm. can talk to that. 
Yeah, absolutely. So there was actually a study that just came out on January 10th, and it would said of this year, um, and it said that there are patients who they, with my bone gland dysfunction, that they actually have increased signs of depression and increased signs of anxiety. And I think part of that reason is because they really don't understand their own symptoms and what's going on with their eyes. And another part of it is sometimes they go to so many different doctors and those doctors just don't, um, you know, they might kind of blow them off and say, you know, this isn't really a, that big of a deal, but it is a really big deal to them. Um, and so it's important that you find someone who really listens and, you know, is willing to do whatever they can do to help you out and stick with you because this is a very complicated thing to treat. Um, and sometimes it's not going to take probably just one visit to solve the problem, maybe in a very, very mild case, but those patients who this is moderate or severe, it's going to take quite a few visits and, and just trying different things out sometimes to really get that right combination of therapy. So it can be very, very frustrating. Um, and as practitioners, I, I really enjoy these patients, like I said, because I feel like I can make a huge difference in their life and they're so appreciative um, you know, when they come to us and we're able to give them uh, these solutions, then they feel so much better. I mean, it's a, it's a terrible thing to always be in pain and for your eyes to always be in pain. And, you know, people <laughs> use their eyes all day long, you know, for what they're doing and they, yeah. they to be conscious of it all the time is, is really a really yeah. a horrible thing. And I remember yeah. uh, there's a, there's a TV broadcaster, Shannon Bream, who she hers wasn't specifically dry eye, but she had, she had, uh, a, some kind of I think she had a basement membrane dystrophy and she mm -hmm. actually talked about possibly she thought about committing suicide that she right. was uncomfortable and it it could really be a horrible thing but there there is definitely help out there and we have a lot of options and we're going to mm -hmm. go over those options but let's talk about again dealing with the cause let's talk about inflammation the core component to chronic disease whether we're talking about uh, macular degeneration, diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular disease. And now we're talking about inflammation and the drug companies know that because, you know, the, the one of the core staples of treating dry eye, such as Restasis, deals with inflammation and Zydra, uh, the mm -hmm. cyclosporin. So they know that we have to beat, uh, we have to beat inflammation. So if you could talk a little bit about it, inflammation and the inflammatory cycle. Absolutely. So inflammation is definitely a hallmark of dry eye disease. Um, in fact, there's a the DUES um, 2 study, which came out from the Tear Film and Ocular Surface Society, has ocular surface inflammation in the definition of dry eyes. So it's multifactorial, there's a loss of homeostasis, and then there's this huge inflammatory component. So the problem with inflammation is it's a vicious cycle. So if we can't get at that inflammation, it's unfortunately going to keep getting worse and worse and worse until we can figure out a way to stop it. Um, and what happens is there's um, somewhere in the cycle, there's a tear film instability that can lead to hyperosmolarity in the eye, in the tear film. And then that can lead to actual cell death of the surface of the cornea and the conjunctival cells. That adds to more inflammation. Again, that inflammation adds to more tear film instability, and it just goes around and around and around. So dry eye disease is actually chronic and it's progressive. So if that means it's you know pretty much a lifelong disease and it will get worse if it's not treated. Um, oftentimes I have patients ask me, you know, is dry eye, is there a solution to dry eye? Can we, can we fix this? And I explained to him, it's, it's not like an infection where you just taking an antibiotic and then it's over and it doesn't come back again. Um, it's actually, it is chronic. So I, I akin it to something like a diabetes or a high blood pressure that it's, once you have it, it is a lifelong condition, but the good news is that we have lots of treatments for it and it's absolutely manageable. Just like you can manage any other chronic disease, you can manage dry eye disease. Let's talk about diagnosis of dry mm -hmm. eye. We talked about myography before, mm -hmm. uh, which is very looking at the meibomian glands, but what else do the eye doctors do, the optometrists to diagnose this condition? Yeah. So just at a very basic level, the first thing that we do is a really thorough slit lamp exam. So if you have a comprehensive eye exam, the slit lamp exam is going to be part of that exam. So first we look at the, the front surface of the eye. So we're looking for your lids and lashes. We're looking for any signs of 
um, you can actually get what we call blepharitis. So it's an inflammation of the lids and lashes where there's little flakes on there and an increase in redness. There can be an increase in, um, you know, of course that meibomian gland dysfunction that we discuss where you have the oils that are blocked in the glands. So we take a really good look at those glands. You can have um, abnormal blood vessels, which we call telangiectasias. And those just contribute to that real redness right along the lid margin. You can actually have something called demodex in the eyes, which is, is a mite that is on the eyelashes. So we look for signs of demodex as well. And then what, we go- What would some of those signs be? When you're looking through the slit lamp, which is a microscope that the eye doctor looks at the front of your eye, yeah. if you have those little mites, you could actually pull them off. And if you put them on the microscope, you can actually see them crawling. Okay. Uh, really kind of kind of bizarre. But uh, so what can we do? Uh, what can we do at that point? Yeah, so if we see demodex and we, we actually see these kind of, we call them colorettes, so these little sticky uh, rings almost on, on the base of the eyelash. Um, and so that's telling us that we need to do what we call is lid hygiene. Um, and it doesn't mean that, you know, you're, you're dirty or, or anything like that. There's quite a large percent of people that actually have demodex. It's just that you're extra prone to them. And so we just have you make sure that you do a really good lid and lash cleansing. So a lot of times patients are afraid to wash their lids and lashes because they don't wanna get soap in their eyes or they don't want them to be more irritated. But we have so many options out there that are cleansers that are really work really well. And they're actually specifically for the lids and lashes. So they're not gonna be hurt your eyes or make them more sensitive. In fact, they're actually really soothing and they're gonna make them feel a lot better. What cleansers would they be? Um, so the first one that I use is, it's called a hypochlorous acid, which sounds really scary, but I always tell my patients it actually is really soothing and it, it's, it's a, a, a thing that's made by the body naturally. So it's naturally going to decrease the inflammation and it's going to decrease the, if there's any extra bacteria, you know, we have bacteria that lives in our skin, lives in our gut that we actually need for everything to be in balance, that homeostasis. Sometimes though, even that good bacteria, we get a little bit too much of it. So the hypochlorous acid works really well for that. That's actually a spray that you close your eyes and you spray it on both eyes and then you just let it air dry. So you let it stay on the lids and lashes. If we need something a little more robust or a little bit stronger, then um, I recommend there is something called Zocular, which was actually made by an ophthalmologist. And that works really great to kill demodex. It actually really, um, it's very anti-inflammatory as well. So it helps with any redness. Um, those are the two that I recommend. And then there are you know, more advanced treatments that we can go to as well. And Zocular, how is that applied to the eye? So Zocular comes in two formulations. There's a lid wipe. So some people prefer a wipe and then some people prefer a foam. So if it's a foam cleanser, you just wash your hands, you do a squirt on you know, maybe two fingers, close your eyes, rub it back and forth, and then you rinse with water. So it's, it's like an extra cleanser. Instead of for your entire face, use it for your lids and lashes. And I just use it, I put it in the shower. And so then I remember, oh, okay, I'm washing my face in the morning and I need to wash my lids and lashes as well. And how about tea tree oil? Yeah, tea tree oil is a, another one that is very common. It's a very common formulation. And with tea tree oil, it does a really great job at killing demodex, and it's been used for many years. Some people are very sensitive to the tea tree oil, and they um, maybe don't prefer the smell of it, or that can be a little bit irritating to the eye. There, so tea tree oil, it works really well to kill demodex, but you just have to be careful sometimes with tea tree oil because there was a study that came out that it, that can actually cause some damage to the meibomian glands if you use it too much. So I do warn my patients that you know, maybe we'll get the initial demodex down with the tea tree oil, but then switch to something more mild once things are under better control. MacU Health, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. And how about makeup? Well, you, you mentioned mm -hmm. makeup before. How does yeah. makeup affect dry eye? What type of makeup should people wear? And uh, how, do, how can we direct people into the right into the right place to use makeup they want to use makeup but it's not going to hurt them that is a great question so makeup does have certain ingredients that can cause more problems with my bomian gland dysfunction and and actually increase the the dry eyes so there's 
uh, certain ingredients, especially things like formaldehyde. Um, there's BAK, which is a preservative that's in quite a bit of, of different mascaras and different types of makeup. So those ingredients can cause problems to the surface of the eye, the ocular surface, and cause more problems with dry eyes. So a couple things we always recommend with makeup is you absolutely positively have to take your eye makeup off at the end of the night. Um, it's just, it, you know, you, you just have to do it because if you don't, it's going to be a breeding ground for more of that bacteria, and it's just going to cause all kinds of problems. So definitely you want to take your eye makeup off at night. Um, we recommend throwing away mascara every three months because it can, can, again, get contaminated with bacteria. So three months, throw away your mascara and throw away your eyeliner. Every six months, we recommend uh, throwing away a shadow. So um, another thing to do is there's something called tight lining or water lining where you put your eyeliner right on top, right in that lid margin where the eyelashes come out, right on top of those meibomian glands. And as you can imagine, that's you're, you're basically suffocating the meibomian glands. So tight lining is an absolute, do not do that. Um, I see it very, very often and I always warn my patients not to. There's be very careful with eyelash extensions. Those are really common, really popular right now. Um, and again, they can have formaldehyde and certain ingredients in them that can make your eyes more sensitive and more inflamed. In fact, I've had at least two patients that came into me that had serious, serious allergic reactions to the formaldehyde that's in the glue that they use for the extensions. And they had to go back and get them taken off because it was just something that their eyes were so red and irritated, they just weren't able to handle it. Um, and fortunately, there's, there's new companies that are coming out that are then they actually make clean or um, safe, you know, makeup that is safe for dry eye patients and isn't going to make your eyes more worse um, and more irritated. So one of those brands is called Eyes of the Story, and that was actually formulated by not an optometrist or ophthalmologist, but someone who works very closely with um, research, with vision research specifically. Um, and so Eyes of the Story is, is a really great brand that you could try. Um, and there's lots of new brands there that are coming out that are really helpful as well. What's the best way to remove makeup at night? That's a great question too. So, I mean, it is sort of a per personal preference. There's tea tree oil based removers that um, We Love Eyes is one that was actually formulated by an optometrist. So that's a good one that some people really like. Um, some people use just, uh, you know, they use wipes. You just wanna, again, look at the ingredients and make sure that there's not any of the um, offending ingredients. Um, and if you want, Carrie, I can actually get a list for you of those ingredients that you wanna watch out for. Um, so yeah, I would just say you, you have to be kind of a detective, you know, you have to look at the ingredients of a lot of different um, formulations, but, um, yeah, is once you find a good one that works for you, it, it's really important. A lot of LASIK patients complain mm -hmm. about dry eye. What, yeah. Why is that? Yeah, so LASIK patients, when what they're doing is they're actually cutting, and the same thing happens with cataract patients, is they're cutting into the cornea. Um, and remember we mentioned before, when you have this vicious cycle of you know, the cell death, um, and that can, so when, so when you make that cut of the incision, when you do the refractive surgery or the cataract surgery, there is some nerve damage that happens. Um, and so sometimes there's something called um, aberrant regeneration. So when those nerves come back together and they heal, they don't heal perfectly the way they were before. They're kind of mismatched or you know, the cells are on top of each other. They're not perfectly linked together. Um, and so that causes some neurological issues with, with the front surface of the eye. So the cornea has actually the most nerve endings of anywhere in the entire body. That's why we're so sensitive when any little change um, happens to the cornea. So it takes sometimes a very long time for patients who have had LASIK, refractive surgery, or have had cataract surgery, it takes a while for that to heal because um, the abnormal healing and then that abnormal healing increases inflammation. And then we have the same cycle that happens again with the tear film instability, you know, just goes around and around. And so oftentimes we'll treat that with a steroid initially to get that inflammation to calm down and everything back in balance again. 
Um, but sometimes there are patients that have dry, dry eye symptoms for months or even years after refractive surgery. I had a patient, uh, my, it's actually my friend's girlfriend who lives in Japan and she has terrible burning in the eyes. You know, a oh. lot of times we're not sure if it's dry eye or something else. And I've had this happen, oh, 20, 30, to maybe 50 times. And she's, she's went to all these different doctors in Japan. And I've had this happen in the U.S. People come in with a bag of drops and their mm -hmm. eyes are burning. And, and it's, a, it's usually a, a middle-aged female over the age of 50, somewhere between 50 and 70. And I asked, and I look at them and I can tell right away because it has a certain look, but they're using wrinkle cream. Oh. So, she, so she has punctal plugs and has had all kinds of things done to her. And all it was, was the wrinkle cream. And, uh, you know, is, green, yeah. the, eyes are th the eyelids are the thinnest tissue in the body and it goes right through. Have you experienced that at all? Absolutely. And I'm so happy that you brought that up because you're right. Uh, things with retinol in it, Retin-A, uh, even Accutane. So any of those kind of wrinkle creams, they use something called retinol, Retin-A typically in them. And when we put them right there, like you said, Carrie, that skin is so delicate right along um, the eyelids. And so there's studies that show that that actually hurts the meibomian glands. It damages the meibomian glands. Uh, and so I, I let my patients know, no retinol, no retin-A right around the eye. It's sort of a shame because dermatology prescribes it all the time. And I don't feel that they really understand that how drying those can be. Sure, they work really great with wrinkles. That's definitely a fact. But at the same time, it's miserable to have these horrible dry eyes. So I tell my patients, um, you know, absolutely do not use them around the eyes. I have them feel where the orbital bone is. And the thing is, a lot of times they're nighttime creams. And so when we sleep, they can travel, right? All that cream can travel to the eyelid. So I tell them, make sure that you don't have it anywhere, feel that orbital rim bone and don't have that retinol anywhere near there. Another thing that you have to be really careful of are often teenagers are an Accutane, which has the same active ingredient in it. And Accutane is a very, very strong drug and that can cause dryness. And so it dries everything out, including the meibomian glands. That's another medication that can cause damage to the meibomian glands. So when I see a teenager on Accutane, you wanna be extra careful for look for any dry eye symptoms. And you have an alternative to wrinkle cream or a type of wrinkle cream that's not as toxic that patients could use? Yeah, there, there are lots of alternatives out there. Um, there's, there's an ingredient called bacchial. I'm not sure if I'm saying that correctly, but that has been shown to have very similar effects of the retinol, but it doesn't have all of the bad side effects. So if you can find, uh, you know, again, a, a nice safe um, alternative uh, that has that ingredient in it, I would definitely give it a try. Maybe that company that you mentioned before might have something like that. Yeah, uh, so they're, um, they're, I know that they're coming out with some new products. So, so that's, a, that's something to look out for in the future, definitely. What was I'll let you know uh, when, I, when they have any updates. What was the name of that company again? I'm sorry. It's called Eyes of the Story. Eyes of the Story. Okay, great. Yeah. So you mentioned medication before. What are some of the big offenders of medications that could cause dry eye? Yeah, so antihistamines are a big one. So think about anything that you're taking orally for allergies. Um, they work really great for allergies, but unfortunately they do dry everything out again. Um, so be careful of those. If you can use them as minimally as possible or use maybe a topical instead of an oral, you know, like a Flonase instead of, you know, your Benadryl or your Allegra, that kind of thing. It's always a balance though, right? Because we don't, we don't want you miserable with your allergies, but we don't want you miserable with your dry eyes either. So there's always a balance there. Um, another uh, medication, antidepressants, birth control pills, things that change the hormone levels of the body, they can cause symptoms with dry eyes as well. So just, just be extra careful if you're on those types of medications. And before you talked a little bit about uh, technology and di for diagnosis, can you mm -hmm. talk about the keratograph and what that does for us? Oh yeah, 
yeah, so that is really, that's sort of the Rolls Royce of dry eye diagnosis. Um, it's something that it's, it's really neat. I don't have one myself. I, I wish we did, but I, I've seen them oftentimes at different trade shows and things like that. And it has all kinds of different scans in one. You can do corneal topography on it. It does, um, you know, it looks, you're, you're included as a mybography. There's actually something that shows you where the tear breakup time. So something I forgot to mention earlier is we do, when our initial diagnosis, we do something called a tear breakup time. So we'll put a, we call it sodium fluorescein. It's a dye, an orange dye that we put in the eye. And so we're actually watching your tear film and we wanna see how long it stays there. So on a normal healthy tear film, it should be there for about 10 to 15 seconds. Anything less than 10 is abnormal. Many times my dry eye patients have it around three. Um, and I have some that immediately, it, your tear film immediately um, breaks up. So that's when that's another way we can kind of gauge the severity of the dryness. Um, and it's a very easy, quick test to do. That sodium fluorescein test, it actually also tells us if there's any areas of uh, what we call superficial punctate keratitis or areas of drying or dead skin cells kind of that are on the front surface of the eye. Um, and the keratograph, it, it does that as well. It does a tear breakup time and it even gives you a measurement of the redness of the eye. It gives you a report that you can share with the patient and really explain um, the areas that need to be treated and focused on with the dry eye. There's another um, really great thing called the lip of view, and that's part of that's from Tear Science Johnson and Johnson. And what that does is it measures the lipid layer thickness of the eye and shows you. So when you have a really thick, nice oil layer, it should look like there's an oil spill, you know, on the concrete with all the different rainbow colors. And you can really tell on patients that have a very, very thin lipid layer, they don't have that sort of rainbow sheen, that oil. Um, so, and it also measures, it does a video um, of the eye and shows the patient if they're doing, remember that incomplete blink or not. And patients are really surprised oftentimes when they think they're blinking and doing a full blink, but in fact, they're kind of doing that incomplete blink. Um, it also does that mybography as well. So there are some really fancy, really great diagnostic tools out there, but it's, it's, they're not necessary, but they are very nice to have. It shows you how complex the eye is from the eyelids to the tear film, to the cornea, to the anterior chamber, to the iris, to the vitreous, to the optic nerve, to the muscles okay. of the eye. So when they're advertising that you could get your eyes examined from a cell phone, <laughs> yeah. not the same as what we could do. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's just some, the eye is so fascinating. There's so many things that go to it to, to have it work correctly. And that, and, and of course the retina. So let's talk about treatment. Uh, the, you mentioned before about artificial tears. Uh, typically a patient will start off with artificial tears, either from recommendation from a doctor, uh, a PCP on their own, they'll go in from a pharmacist. How, how effective are artificial tears and where can, how far can artificial tears take the patient? So that, that's a great point. Um, not that far. <laughs> um, artificial tears are what we use. It's usually the very first thing that we use, and it's really just to treat the symptoms. It's just to kind of get you through, right? But it's almost akin to putting a Band-Aid uh, on something. It's not going to get at the root cause of the dryness. Um, and so it is really just a temporary thing. And um, it, it's, it's great for incredibly mild cases, but most patients are gonna need more. Let's talk about some of the medications. Let's start with the cyclosporins. We have uh, our old standby Restasis, which has been very effective for years. And now we have a new one that's almost double the, uh, the, double the concentration, Sequa. If you could talk about Restasis, Sequa, about, about cyclosporin and how that could help our dry eye patients. Absolutely. So cyclosporins, as you said, they've been around for quite a long time, close to 20 years, I think, and they're very safe and they're very effective. So what they do is they decrease the inflammation in the eye. Um, and the, I mentioned before TFAS and DUS2, they actually have an algorithm. And so once you have those patients that get from past the mild to more the mild to the moderate, we start doing what we call step two therapies. And cyclosporin is in that step two therapy. 
Um, there's a new drug, as you mentioned, Sequa, that came out, which is twice the strength of Restasis. And it has something called, um, it uses nanotechnology basically. So they have something with their nanomicelle uh, delivery system. And what that is better for is it does a really great job of, incre of um, excuse me, penetrating the tear film and the ocular surface. So it really gets to the cornea where it needs to be and to the tear film and the conjunctival tissue as well. Um, and I found really great results with Sequa with my patients. I have one patient who she has done everything. She's done IPL, she's done LipaFlow, she has done punctal plugs, a toggle serum. I mean, you name it, she has done that dry eye treatment. And she actually told me the one thing that has really, really helped her is Sequa. So Sequa is twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening. And she told me that she knows at right at 4 p.m. that, okay, it's time for my next, my next drop. Um, so she said it's been an absolute game changer for her. So I would recommend Sequa maybe on two on your Restasis patients who um, they've been on Restasis for a very long time and did well with Restasis, but now they're finding they, they need something more. You could possibly try Sequa. Um, I had one very, very interesting patient too who has Thigason's disease, which is a disease that um, it's, it's miserable and, and very devastating to the patient because they have these exacerbations where there's ex this extreme inflammation of the cornea, even to the fact that they have what we call infiltrates come into the cornea and just sort of wreak havoc. And it's so bad that when these patients have the exacerbations that they can't even go outside because they're so sensitive to the light, it really, really affects their quality of life. So this particular patient of mine, he um, uses Sequa for his thigusins. He has dry eye disease as well. And he, again, he said the Sequa is the only thing that helps him. Um, he used to get his exacerbations or sort of breakouts every month and a half. And now it's been six months and he's just doing really, really well. So yeah. it's, okay. a, it's a really, it's a great, great drop. Those patients have these little micro abrasions and they're just miserable. Yeah, yeah. So it's been a life changing for him. And let's talk about Zydra. Yeah. So Zydra is in the same category. It's it works in a slightly different mechanism, um, but that's a great a great one too. It's very it works uh, on decreasing inflammation, and that's one of the things we really want to focus on when treating dry eye. If we can get that inflammation under control, then everything seems to fall in line a lot easier, a lot better. And how do you use Zydra? Do you use it as, as recommended? I know with me, yeah. I'm a little bit off label. I just have the patient use it at night when I'm using it because of the, it could cause blurred vision and maybe an abnormal taste. And yeah. I find that it works very well just right before they go to sleep. So I don't have to deal with the, the so the patient doesn't have to deal with the blurred vision. True. Yeah. Um, I typically use it twice a day, once in the morning, once in the evening, but you're right. There are oftentimes side effects to these different medications. And some are able to be tolerated and some aren't. So I always encourage my patients to just try it out um, because sometimes those small amount of side effects are worth it if you're getting, you know, tons and tons of relief. So I do warn them, there are some, some blurry vision, some stinging, sometimes some metallic taste in the back of the throat. But if they can get past that, you know, minute or two of the side effects, then I think my cat here is in, maybe in the picture. <laughs> um, then, you know, it's, it's a really, it's a really great drop. So get, so I would say, give it a chance before you say this isn't for me. And let's talk about steroids. Now there's a new low dose steroid. Uh, if you could talk about that and, and eye flares. Yeah, so this is something really interesting that there's been some new research about. And we used to use something called Lodamax when we really had tons of inflammation and just needed to do case that down. And we typically use it in shorter doses. So a week, two weeks, maybe a month uh, at the most, because we do have side effects with steroids. So it's not something that we can use long-term like your cyclosporin, your sequa, your restasis, your zydra. Those are things we can use for years and years and years if we need to, but steroids, we're not able to do that. So that there's actually a new drug called Isuvis, which is half the concentration. It's 0.25% of a steroid. And that was specifically to treat these dry eye flares, which are really interesting in patients that have chronic dry eye disease. So think of a dry eye flare as something similar to when you have a flare with an allergy. 
you know, you might be really good and under really good, manage really well under really good control for a long period of time. But then all of a sudden something happens, there's something that changes that balance, right? That homeostasis, whether it's something in the environment or maybe you're doing a lot of extra screen time at work and everything is back you know, out of balance again. So patients that have this chronic dry eye disease, they typically have these flares and they can occur five to six times per year. Um, and they think that's because of, there was a study that came out that said there was an inflammatory basis behind these dry eyes. So your typical patient who might have some, you know, ocular surface inflammation, they have this inflammatory response that kind of spikes up. It's the initial response. And then you have an adaptive and that goes back down and then you have an adaptive response. And then after some time, those are going to kind of level out when you have a chronic dry eye patient, however, they're already sort of hypersensitive. So their immune system is already up here with their innate and their adaptive response. And so that's why any little change in their environment is actually gonna have them flare up a lot more easier. So by flare up, I mean increase in symptoms, maybe increase in redness. Um, and it's just a lot easier for them to get to that inflammation and then get to that extra response. And so what they're recommending is a very short term, so two weeks at a time of the steroid drop can help them with those flares and, and decrease that down. So they're not as symptomatic. People know that steroid eye drops could cause glaucoma or cataracts. Mm -hmm. Do we have to worry about it with this, with this drop? So you always have to worry about it. Yeah, and that's why I said you can't use steroids on a long term. You have to, um, it could increase pressure. Um, it, it could, you know, cause glaucoma, it could increase your risk of cataracts. And so, but if you use them for very short periods of time, for two weeks at a time, they can be very beneficial and very helpful. And the nice thing is this is a very low dose steroid. So it's a lot safer than ones we have in the past, but it's not some, it's something that you need to continue to see um, your doctor for checkups. Yeah, definitely. You want to make sure that everything is still nice and healthy. Like Carrie said, with, with the back of the eye, the cataract, um, the lens, you want to make sure you're looking at the lens and making sure you're incre not increasing in pressure. We have another new kid on the block, a nasal spray, mm -hmm. Tervia yeah. uh, or varincycline, uh, mm -hmm. which is the same ingredient as Chant Chantix uh, that stops us people, helps people stop smoking. But Chantix is one milligram and this is 0 0.03 milligrams. Can you talk about Tervia? Yeah, so Tervia, Tervia, I, I, I'm not sure how they want us to say it. It's a, that's how new it is. It's so brand new. It's only been out, oh gosh, I think it came out in December. Um, so very, very exciting. And this is completely new completely novel. It's a nasal spray. We've never had a nasal spray to specifically treat dry eye disease and the symptoms of dry eye disease before. So it's really interesting. And I actually have it here with me. I got a sample of it. And it's believed to bind to the cholinergic receptors that activate the trigeminal parasympathetic pathway. So what it does is we have endings in the nerve endings in the nose right here. And so what it does is it stimulates that pathway and it helps to actually not just produce um, what's called reflex hearing. So reflex hearing is something that you have. It's, it's a reflex is what it is. You get something in your eye, your eyes tear due to that problem. This actually and, increases- And the reflex tearing is what the, the men are complaining about when the tearing <laughs> is running down their face and they're embarrassed. That's reflex tearing. <laughs> That's when, reflex tearing. When the, when the brain says, when, when your eyes are dry, it sends a signal to the brain, my eyes are dry, back to the lacrimal gland produces these, the wrong tears that start going down your face. So I just wanted to interrupt that for a second. Yes, absolutely. So that's that extra, extra tearing that you really feel your eyes get all watery. But what this do, does, which is really great, is it actually increases your basal tear film. So that's your regular tear film. So this isn't going to make you, you know, cry, cry, cry because it's irritating. It actually increases your regular tears. Um, and it, so what it does is, again, it activates the trigeminal parasympathetic pathway. And the easiest way to get to that is at the nose. And that is the pathway, as Carrie said, it innervates the lacrimal functional unit. So that includes the goblet cells, the lacrimal glands, and the meibomian glands. So it's actually helping to get secretions of your natural tears. So what we talked about before, you're getting the musa and the aqueous and the lipid layers that you need. And there's just no substitute to your eyes' natural tears. You, we tried to make all kinds of artificial tears, but 
the best thing you can possibly have is more of your eyes natural tears because they have all those wonderful components in them. Um, and you're right, it is the, the same ingredient um, as Chantix, it's a third, um, it's the same active ingredient. Um, and, but you're not going to have those same side effects that, you know, there might be with, with the other medication. And in fact, Chantix has been out for a very long time and it's a very safe to use medication. So, um, I will say that there is a little bit of a learning curve to use this medication. So whatever you do, it was, it was funny. I'll tell you a quick story. When I um, first got this, I, I wasn't there the day that our rep dropped it off. And so he gave us all these samples and um, I just saw it on, on the counter and I thought, oh, I'm going to give this a try. And I, as I might've mentioned before, I suffer from allergies as well. So I am used to using Flonase. And so I put it in there, inhaled it. <laughs> And believe me, do not inhale. This is not meant to inhale because you'll be coughing and all kinds of irritation. Um, and so all you do is you just take it and you actually point it towards the little crease right here that's in your nose. So try not to touch the nose itself, but you just, I usually use my opposite hand. So you take it in there and you just little spray. Remember, don't inhale. So just one quick spray. And then same thing on the other side, one quick spray. Um, and that you're gonna use twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. There are, again, as we mentioned, you will occasionally get some side effects from different medications. This one does have some, some side effects. So 82% of patients experience sneezing. I did sneeze a couple times. 16% um, experience a cough. 13% um, experienced throat irritation. And this is from the clinical studies that they did. And 8% experienced installation site irritation. But like I said, there is sort of a little bit of a learning curve. Once you get used to it the first couple of days, a lot of those side effects will go away because then you figure out how to use it in the correct way. Uh, Varin cycling, uh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. It's Chantex for the eye. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEbroadcasting.com and sign up today. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicell, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicell technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. Each generation was supposed to be healthier than the last one. Lifespan was supposed to be increasing. We were supposed to be in this paradise by now. Instead of getting healthier and healthier, it seems to have gone the opposite way. Millennials were projected to be the first generation in history to not outlive the generation before them. We are certainly headed for disaster. I think a lot of people are beginning to question the whole story. We live in a time where the paradigms are shifting. And the optometrist, in my opinion, is one of the best kept secrets. The public doesn't realize about going to the eye doctor. So many different diseases actually manifest in the eye. The back of the eye is the only place in the body that you could actually see the blood vessels. Completely non-invasively, you could screen thousands of people, not just for their eye health, but for their whole body health. Because this disease is here, it's also gonna be here. And I can look into the back of my eyeball and there are expert doctors on the ground who are looking at my eyeball while I'm doing it. The eye is the canary of the mind. The eye is the kingdom. Will everyone please Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. 
es natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You. And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.